Good morning. Welcome to Uni University Mennonite Church on this first Sunday in Advent. It's also our first morning with some snow. Um, we welcome all of you here in the sanctuary and those of you on Zoom. And uh, we will now have the prelude. Can one be homesick for something you've never known? We are homesick for a just world, for peace like rivers, for the end of suffering. Yes, we are homesick for joy that is contagious, for nations that feel like neighbors, and for hospitals that run empty. We are homesick for the world God promises. We are homesick, but we are on our way. God is here, God is still creating. Let us worship holy God.
We'll now have the lighting of the Advent wreath. We hope for a world where all are fed. We hope for a world with more bridges than walls. We hope for a world with wide open doors. We hope for a world with contagious laughter. We hope for a world where trees grow tall and creeks run clean. We hope for a world where all people feel at home, in their bodies, in, in the church, in their physical homes. We hope for that world. We long for that world. We are homesick for that world. So today, we light the candle of hope because hope keeps our hearts alive as we wait. May this light be a reminder that the wait is always worth it. We are close to home. May we carry hope with us. Amen. Would you please stand if you're able and join me in the prayer of confession. Gracious God, we find ourselves with two options every day, to stay homesick for the world you had in mind or to allow cynicism to win. Do we hope against hope or do we throw in the towel? Do we insist on a better world, or do we assume it's impossible? Forgive us for the days when cynicism wins. Forgive us for numbing our homesick hurt instead of using it to fuel a better world. Kindle in us a hope that won't let go. Gratefully we pray, amen. Come see the beauty of the Lord. Come see the beauty of the Lord. Mm -hmm. Taste and see, He'll set you free. Come praise the living Lord. When I was down, he raised me up. When I was down, he raised me up, raised me up. He raised me up, filled my empty cup with never-ending love. Come, lose your darkness in his light. Come, lose your darkness in his light. Yeah, yeah. Raise your face, let it be bathed 
with never ending light. Lions go hungry and eagles fall. The world is wider, 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 and oh, so tall. The Lord will hear you when you call, and He'll save you. Yes, He'll save you. You know He'll save you. When you call, the Lord will heal your broken heart. The Lord will heal your broken heart. Call His name, He'll heal your shame and mend. To call out his name, he'll heal your shame and bend your broken. I'll now offer the prayer for illumination. God of the stars and God of our hearts, our days will pass, but your words will last. The grass will wither, but your words will last. Our memories might blur, but your words will last. The sky could go dark and your words would last. As we listen today, help us hold on to what will last. Help us hold on to you. Amen. Hello, University of Nanana Church. Hola from Fiji. When, uh, when Kate and Ben asked me if I could think of a time when I found home in an unusual place, the answer came really quick. So here's a story that took place when our kids were very little. When they were young, we were living in Wisconsin, of course, at the Trout Farm. And each of our sets of parents lived about four hours away each. And it seemed like every Christmas, we would switch and go from one to the other for Christmas. And then we would visit the other one whenever in a little while. And we always talked about when are we going to have our own Christmases at home? Um, so w one year, I guess it was the year Abby was born, Otis was born. We were heading down to Kathy's parents and we had a big old station wagon and we started out it was light snow and by the time we got an hour or so into it it was heavy snow and by the time we got about halfway to the Quad Cities in Moline it was that sort of rainy snow that causes treacherous ruts in the four lane and you're not sure if you're going to get thrown into the other lane and the trucks are racing by spraying stuff on and we were just getting completely stressed out um, thinking why do we have to risk life and death in our, in our precious children to try to get home for Christmas um, and we just pulled the plug we stopped we decided it's it's not going to go any further we pulled off the road checked into a hotel that was completely empty of course ordered a pizza which was a couple restaurants up two doors up the street and within about a half hour, we went from this life and death, total white knuckle stressful situation to, uh, I guess, to home. And no Christmas presents, no Christmas music. We took the kids down to the pool. It was the first time Otis had ever been in the water. And it just immediately turned into this lovely, wonderful Christmas at home situation. And I've never forgotten that. I've never forgotten how we did. And of course, the parents were pretty upset because we weren't at their home for Christmas. But we got there safe and sound the next day. The storm blew through. It was clear and bright the next day. And we drove down and, and had a good Christmas together. 
So there you go. That's where I found home in an unusual place. Now we're having home in these unusual places, and we wish you all blessings and uh, God's peace on you. Bye-bye. Good morning, children. Welcome to Children's Time on this first Sunday of Advent. Advent is the four weeks before Christmas when we prepare our hearts to celebrate Jesus' birth. And one way we can do that is by remembering the stories of all the people who prepared the way for Jesus. Jesus didn't just land in the stable one night. There are many people over many years who prepared the way for him to come. And some of those people were men and women who were called prophets. And prophets lived hundreds of years before Jesus. And they were speaking to the people of Israel and Judah during some really hard times. Um, the Israelites and people from Judah had bad kings. They were sometimes being attacked by other kings. Um, even some of their people got carried away to live in other countries. And the prophets spoke comforting words to the people and they also told them that they needed to share with each other especially with the poor people among them and then they also told them about what was going to happen in the future and one of the things they told about was jesus that jesus would be coming someday even though it was hundreds of years before so listen to these words from the prophet isaiah who lived 700 years before jesus for a child has been born for us, a son given to us. Authority rests upon his shoulders, and he is named Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and Prince of Peace. Isaiah called Jesus the Prince of Peace. And now listen to the words of Micah, who lived around the same time as Isaiah. But you, Bethlehem, Ephrathah, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come one who will be a ruler over Israel, whose origins are from of old, from ancient times. That was the prophet Micah, and he told the Israelites that this prince of peace would be born in Bethlehem. And finally, here are the words of Zechariah, who lived 500 years before Jesus. Rejoice greatly, daughter Zion. Shout, daughter Jerusalem. See your king comes to you, righteous and victorious, lowly and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. Zechariah told the Israelites that this prince of peace named Jesus, who was going to be born in Bethlehem, would one day ride on a donkey through Jerusalem. Do you remember that story about Jesus? So these are three of the prophets, of the many prophets, who told people about Jesus coming hundreds of years before Jesus was born. They all helped to prepare the way for Jesus. And for these four Sundays of Advent, we're going to hear more stories of people who helped to prepare the way for Jesus, and for his parents, Mary and Joseph. And as we hear these stories, each week we're going to move Mary and Joseph closer and closer to the stable until they finally arrive on Christmas Eve. So let's pray together. Dear God, thank you for these prophets who told about Jesus coming long before his birth. Help us to prepare our hearts to celebrate your birth. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I'll be reading from Mark 5. Verses 21 to 30. When Jesus had crossed again in the boat to the other side, a great crowd gathered around him, and he was by the sea. Then one of the leaders of the synagogue named Jairus came, and when he saw him, fell at his feet and begged him repeatedly, My little daughter is at the point of death. Come and lay your hands on her so that she may be made well and live. So Jesus went with him. And a large crowd followed him and pressed in on him. Now there was a woman who had 
been suffering from hemorrhages for 12 years. She had endured much under many physicians and had spent all that she had and she was no better, but rather grew worse. She had heard about Jesus and came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak, for she said, if I but touch his clothes, I'll be made well. Immediately her hemorrhage stopped and she felt in her body that she was healed of her disease. Immediately aware that power had gone forth from him, Jesus turned in the crowd and said, who touched my clothes? Now I'll be reading from Colossians 3, 12 to 14. Colossians 3, 12 to 14. As God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. Bear with one another. And if anyone has a complaint against another, forgive each other. Just as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. Above all, clothe yourselves with love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. Good morning. Let's pray. Advent is about anticipation, is a season of anticipation. As we enter this time of reflection, I pray that we may be motivated by the spirit of anticipation, of hope. Amen. She had heard what people were saying about Jesus. So she came out from behind in a crowd and touched his cloak. For she said to herself, if I touch even his clothes, I shall be cured. And there and then, the source of her hemorrhages dried up and she knew in herself that she was cured of her trouble. I like to think that scripture is like a mansion with many entryways. We learn different things depending on the door that lets us in. The good news is that no matter the door we enter through, the experience we encounter can enrich us. We can enter this text by focusing on the woman, her faith. If I touch even his clothes, I shall be cured. We can ask what was the source of such faith? What risks did she take to exercise her faith? What are the ways in which we express our faith today? How does our own faith compare with hers? And how may our faith be strengthened? Through another door, we can marvel at the unbelievable sensitivity of Jesus. Who touched my clothes? Is such awareness only reserved for the Son of God? How does one cultivate just a little bit of this sensitivity. But today, I invite us to enter through another door. The door that opens out to the disciples' reaction. And we read, His disciples said to him, You see the crowd pressing upon you, and yet you ask, Who touched me? This door invites us to reflect on this perfectly reasonable question. 
How can you ask who touched me? How can you isolate that one touch from all the many others when you're in the middle of a crowd? We shall organize our reflection around three subheadings. What is the time and place for miracles and healing? What is compassion? We shall consider compassion as a compass for passion. Finally, we shall consider the clothes of Jesus. What was Jesus wearing? This reflection, I hope, will lead us to some important half-truths. First, getting to heaven is not like thermodynamics. The path matters. All roads do not lead to Rome. Second. And third, the path is the destination. And lastly, what we wear for the journey our clothes do matter. So let's begin by asking, what's the time, the place for miracles or for healing? We read again from the scriptures, you see the crowd pressing upon you and yet you ask, who touched me? In my line of business, we often sprinkle our scientific papers with expression like, it is generally accepted that, or it is well established that. In their response to Jesus, the disciples were invoking their version of this. Quote, you see the crowd pressing upon you, and yet you ask, who touched me? It is well known, it is common sense, it is obvious that in a crowd there's random contact and any reasonable person would not presume a uniqueness to a particular touch. You see the crowd pressing upon you. Just open your eyes and you'll see the obvious. Use your brains, Jesus, be realistic. The disciples' response to Jesus raises an important question. Where and when do miracles or healings occur? When we go back to the beginning of this whole story, we find that Jesus and his disciples were actually on their way somewhere. They were going somewhere else when this woman approached Jesus. We read from Mark 5, verses 22 and 24. Then came one of the rulers of the synagogue. Jairus by name, and seeing him, he fell at his feet and besought him, saying, My little daughter is at the point of death. Come and lay your hands on her, so that she may be made well and live. And he went with him, and a great crowd followed him and thronged about him. Jesus had been approached by a religious leader, Jairus, to come to the deathbed of his daughter. The disciples could not see the possibility that a miracle could occur on the way. They were so focused on the expected miracle at the place, the bedside of the daughter of Jairus. When and where do miracles or healings occur? The message here is that we do good not only at the end of the journey, but also during the journey. The journey is part of the end. The journey is as important as the destination. Perhaps the issue is not the place, but the moment. The moment can be at any place. This is the spirit behind Paul's advice to Timothy in 2 Timothy 4.2. The 
The New English Bible puts it this way. Proclaim the message. Press it home on all occasions. Convenient or inconvenient. Be on duty at all times. In science, we use terms such as thermodynamics and kinetics in discussing chemical reactions. That is, the atomic rearrangements that transform one material or compound into another. Thermodynamics relates to the energy required to get a given reaction, to get a given task done. And kinetics is concerned with how far you can get and how quickly. It focuses on the path you take in your attempt to get the task done. The response of the disciples opens up the question as to whether we should take a thermodynamic or kinetic approach to life. I believe that this story teaches us that kinetics matter, that the path we take matters. We have all heard the saying, all roads lead to Rome, but do they really? I believe Jesus' answer would be an emphatic no. There are Rome attracting roads and Rome repelling roads. The path we take matters. The disciples were focused on the destination, the thermodynamics. They did not realize that the path also matters. That is, in fact, the path is the destination. That what happens along the way also matters. What about compassion? As I said earlier, I would like us to consider compassion as a compass for passion. There's a well-known parable that I believe relates directly to this reaction of the disciples. Their response to Jesus' question. And this is the parable of the Good Samaritan. Luke chapter 10 verses 30 to 37. We are told that the priest and the Levite passed on the other side. But the Samaritan had compassion and stopped to take care of the roadside victim. The Samaritan had compassion. The dictionary tells us that the word compassion means sympathetic feeling, pity, mercy, I would like us to go further. Perhaps we are taking some liberties here. And consider the word compass in compassion. Going back to the dictionary again, we learn that the word compass refers to boundary, circumference, an enclosed space, range, scope, a device for determining direction by means of a magnetic needle, an instrument for drawing circles. So what do we take from this? That having compassion has to do with the nature of our circles. Narrow or wide, expanding or contracting. Our circumference, the boundary we set or draw around ourselves, narrow or broad. Compassion then 
has to do with space. Having space for others. Compassion raises the question, who shows up on my radar? Let's now consider the clothes of Jesus. What was Jesus wearing? In spite of the disciples' skepticism, Jesus was aware that he had received a special kind of touch. How to cultivate such spiritual sensitivity? While I was reflecting on this question, I remembered the following story that appeared in the Santa Daily Times a few years ago about a police officer who had then recently completed special training, quote, to recognize the impairment caused by drugs. The catchy heading of the article was, quote, now trained, officer vows to have keen eye, end of quote. Quoting from the newspaper article, we are told, patrolling officers are taught how to recognize the signs of impairment from alcohol, but only 64 state and local police officers across the state are trained to recognize impairment from drugs. We are further told that the officer underwent three plus weeks of intense training in which he learned the signs of seven classes of drugs." End of quote. So then, how about us? What classes can we take? How can we extend our compass? How can we be more like Jesus so that we can sense that special touch in a crowd? It all has to do with the clothes. What was Jesus wearing? While I was preparing this sermon, I also learned about the no contact jacket, specially designed for women. The ad I saw on the internet described it as, quote, a wearable defensive jacket created to aid women in their struggle for protection from violence, end of quote. I learned further that, quote, when activated by the wearer, 80,000 volts of low amperage, electric current pulses, just below the surface shell or the entire jacket. This exoelectric arm armor prevents any person from unauthorized contact with the wearer's body. If an assailant were to take hold <clears> of <throat> the wearer or to grab hold of the wearer, the high voltage would interrupt their neurological impulses, which control voluntary muscle movement. End of quote. Very impressive and certainly a serious and worthy contribution to the defensive armor of the modern woman. But I doubt, I doubt that Jesus' sensitivity was powered by high voltage, low amperage, electrical pulses. So then, what was Jesus wearing? And what should we wear to be more like Jesus? I believe that here we get some help from our second scripture reading. Put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassion, kindness, lowliness, meekness, and patience, forbearing one another, and if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other. As the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. Above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect 
harmony. Other scriptures reinforce this. Clothe yourselves, all of you, with humility toward one another. For God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. 1 Peter 5, 5. But put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to gratify his desires. Romans 13, 14. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Galatians 3, 27. Let's pray. May the Lord help us to be not only hearers of the word, but also doers. May the Lord help us so we do not put limits on where healing can occur. May the Lord help us to extend the reach of our compasses. And may the Lord clothe us for his service. Amen. A few reminders of announcements this morning. We received an email about uh, receiving contributions for Park Forest Preschool. Please remember that we are accepting cash donations to buy gift cards for those families up through December 10th. For those of you on Zoom, feel free to stay afterwards. The Zoom room will stay open. I'm wondering if we have birthdays or anniversaries to share. Or any visitors with us today. Well, I invite you to stand now for the benediction. This is a unique benediction we'll be using throughout the Advent season uh, and it refers to the journey we will each be taking. As you leave this service, your service begins. Comfort the homesick, open your doors to others, seek sanctuary, be brave enough to go home by another way. And remember that here in God's house, all are welcomed. So come back soon in the name of our foundation, God, spirit and son, go in peace.